A lot of times there's the tension on the fast charge network, but really we only need fast charges every 50 miles. I mean, we don't really need a fast charge off every exit. The the EV space will not be at 100% uh, dominance of the EV market anytime soon. 30, 30% would be a really hyper high lofty goal on EVs in the, as far as the, the share goes in the market. And in that instance, if you got to that percentage, you can spread out the char- the fast charging stations around. But the average person would never need to use it if you have the appropriate level two system around. If I can go to a restaurant and sip on some energy and I can go to the mall and sip on some energy and go to my job and have a level two charger or my house, you'll never really need the, the fast charging network. Welcome back to Turn Down For What, your source for EV news and updates. Like and subscribe for more content like this episode. Let's dive on in. Welcome back to Turn Down For What. Another day? Another Another episode. There we are. (laughs) We're back, boys. All right. Well, today we have uh, another riveting conversation for uh, us um we wanted to um we've actually been trying <laughs> for a couple of weeks but with how busy our uh podcast schedule's been we've uh, kind of uh gapped some communication but uh we have sean uh on the line from switch energy sean welcome to the podcast great to have thank you guys really appreciate being here i'm excited Absolutely. big fan of you guys thank you well um you know obviously uh past couple of weeks we you know obviously spotlighted the gmc um then we had some finally got our uh aviation conversation that we've been working to have uh but today we're gonna switch gears um we've had a little bit of discussions in the past about multifamily uh fleet and some uh, other deployments and wanted to bring sean on uh sean tell us a little bit about yourself your history and uh what you do yeah no appreciate it um God, where to begin? The EV space is still a bit of the Wild West, but uh, we've been having a really good time at Switch kind of finding our space in it. Um, So my name is Sean Murphy. I'm the Senior Business Development Manager for Switch. I live in the Boston area and oversee the Eastern Region sales, so from Maine down to Florida. Um, And I've been with Switch now for two and a half years, was in the sustainability space for a bit beforehand, doing a lot of like retrofits of uh, multifamily buildings for energy efficiency measures. And uh, before that, I was uh, active duty Navy. So I got out in 2018 um, and just been kind of hitting the ground running ever since and found a good spot in the EV space. I've been kind of had it on the radar for a long time and stars aligned and uh, was reaching out to a few different companies. And this one just seemed to be the best fit for me and um, got to be a part of a very small company growing exponentially. So that's been a, a pretty cool experience as well. Seems like a lot you, in the uh, energy space uh, has developed a lot in the last two or three years. There's been, you know, a, a million players entering the space, but you're starting to see some of those um, dominant ones thrive. And, you know, those that have an, a, a unique product to offer the market uh, really step up and thrive. But I mean, there's a lot of a lot of opportunity. And like you said, I mean, it is the wild, wild west. But, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of land to conquer when it comes to uh, comes to this space. So. For sure. I feel like it's a bit of a dog years in the EV space. You know, it's just every new week, there's like a new flashy tool that's out and you got to kind of pivot and understand who your competitors are and where you bring your value and, you know, staying true to what you what you came out of the doors with. And so that's been an interesting landscape to navigate as well. We've seen that. I mean, we had the discussion. I forgot who it was with, but they were basically saying that the European market, you know, is so they're ahead and so you're so starting bad. to see yeah. <laughs> you're starting to see like you know it like it's a lot more competitive and you have to have a very specific value proposition to get into the space but the united states is so much earlier in that curve that we're kind of at that moment of ramping up all of these businesses that are trying to find their uh space in the energy renewable ev space uh with charging to solar to otherwise and so we're seeing a lot of um activity in in the in the uh the u.s market specifically uh, a lot of charging providers coming from europe over um and a lot of uh, manufacturing being done here around the billions of dollars of funding that's currently available yeah i think um if you take like kind of a thirty thousand foot view of the space and and how we've gone to market one of the things i've always appreciated about this company is you know there's a pretty vast gambit of of 
entry points into this industry, right? And everyone's kind of trying to find their unique spin on things and getting into. And what we're realizing is, and really kind of the impetus of this company of the multifamily vertical and workplace charging was that, you know, our owner of our company, Carter, he was a Toronto resident, lived downtown, drove a Tesla and had nowhere to plug in in his high rise, right? And so he's a much smarter man than myself. And he he put together a, a great team and started to figure I have out. actually driven a Tesla in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. I, I've got to drive in Toronto too. I, I, I will say if you've ever driven Boston, that's a real, a real test of driving skills. But that's kind of how we've really kind of continue to approach the market. And we've seen a lot of companies try to do too many things in the EV space and not do any of them very well, um, where we've realized like, hey, this could be our lane, let's stick in it and let's do it really, really well. Um, and, you know, we've taken some hard looks at data on our CRMs and like, where are we winning? And it's the multifamily level two charging. Um, it's profitable, it's equitable for all the users. We're bringing a much needed amenity to a lot of these buildings. Um, and so that's kind of where we really leaned in as a company. And like I mentioned, we can do a lot of things as a software company in the DC fast charging world, and we can kind of dip our toes into a lot of different verticals, but that's where we found our biggest success. So I mean, obviously you've alluded to it, but tell us officially switch energy. What, what is your, um, official, like what is the, the, the mission of the business? Yeah. I mean, if we could simplify it into a sentence, it's smart you know, smart charging uh, for busy buildings, right? And so we've figured out a way to add a pretty significant load of chargers, whether it either a dedicated EV panel and or we have technology for a lot of retrofit scenarios. So not everybody, again, has the luxury of having an incentive program in their area um, and or the capital to bring these types of infrastructure upgrades in. So we have a lot of really unique ways to add more charging to buildings without blowing the ceiling off the building um, and being able to control all of that with dynamic charging, um, different price rates, and we can make it very customizable for a lot of these end users, which has been a big success for us. I feel like this is an area that is really underserved and uh, goes without a lot of the fanfare, uh, but you can install so many DC or so many AC chargers for what it would cost for just one. Yep. Uh, of the DC, much less an entire site of them. Um, and, and that's really where um, I, I, th I think nobody wants to be stranded in the middle of an unfamiliar place. So DC charging gets the attention uh, sure. because if it's sexier, you know, it's, you know, it's bigger, it's flashier, it's more powerful for sure. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but in, in terms of the folks that are, that are calling on, on you guys, have you noticed any, any trends or any patterns about where, um, where you're finding that there is the appetite for it. Like what's the motivation? Where's it coming from? Is it, is it property managers being asked, uh, you know, by the, the tenants? Is it, um, is it property managers trying to see forward into the future and be more enticing? Like, have you noticed any kind of uh, patterns evolve? Yeah, where where great, is the market? Great question. And kind of all of the above, right? Um, not to be ambiguous with my answer, but it's really kind of depends on the portfolio manager. So like the bigger players, like the gray stars and the bazudos where they have a sustainability kind of practices in their, what they're preaching. So there's a lot of kind of getting the head of the curve and wanting to be a trendsetter, so to speak. Um, and then we're also with hard data, we're looking at amenities and buildings and, and EV charging is becoming the number one amenity. Um, whereas, you know, you're losing tenants, you're having people go to different, uh, residents if they don't have EV charging. So the same theory is why do you put a pool in your building, right? It does nothing but cost you money. This is actually something that generates revenue, um, and can help retain your residents and, and grow some, some of the market of people driving EVs tend to be a little bit more affluent and you're getting a, a different type of people in your building. So it's, it's a really good retention tool. Um, and also to, to practice sustainability and, and showcase what your portfolio is doing. So we have abilities to kind of send out all those ESG, ESG reportings, the greenhouse gas emission stuff. Like that's a, a big feature that a lot of properties are looking at. Just before we went on air, we kind of highlighted it for a second, but you know, the, a single family home, you know, if you own a house and you know, you can install your own charger and it's not that big of a deal. But a multifamily, and a lot of times people don't have access or the permissions to access the power uh, that's needed uh, to do the level of charging that these vehicles want. And so in that regard, being a multifamily facility, 
um, you know, whether that's in an urban area or not. I mean, there's a demand for uh, solutions like that to be provided because, you know, a lot of the big portion of the population lives in multifamily uh, type dwellings and then have not having any charging solutions. You'd have to park your car outside uh, or have to stop at superchargers or whatever in order to uh, fill up. And, you know, like you, I think you said it a second ago, Chris, I mean, a lot of times there's the attention on the fast charge network, but really we only need fast charges every 50 miles. I mean, we don't really need a fast charge off every exit. The, the EV space will not be at a hundred percent dominance of the EV market anytime soon. 30, 30% would be a really hyper high lofty goal on EVs in the, as far as the, the share goes in the market. And in that instance, if you got to that percentage, you can spread out the char- the fast charging stations around. But the average person would never need to use it if you have the appropriate level two system around. If I can go to a restaurant and sip on some energy and I can go to the mall and sip on some energy and go to my job and have a level two charger or my house, you'll never really need the the fast charge network. A gas station needs to be in a town because a gas station, that's the only fueling source. But your house is your fueling source. Your job is your fueling source. And so the average person that's commuting from their house to their job, if there's a charger at their house and at their job, they will never need a public charging station as far as a um, a, a DC fast charger or beyond. That's for travelers traveling down the interstate. It's going to be more expensive and it's going to be... Um, it's going to be uh, more infrastructure than what's needed for them to fill up in 20 minutes. Now there's a use case for it. Uber drivers and those kind of things need the fast charging network, but you know, in, in all reality, we're not, you know, I don't think the EV space would be anytime soon in any need of um, having clusters of charging stations, unless you're in a major city, um, but having networks of thousands and thousands of level two chargers that are spread around a region will then allow you to go, to, you know, hey, I'm going to go to the mall and shop for three hours. But while you're there, you can get 50 kilowatts of energy, uh, which is enough to fill up a, a, almost a Tesla battery. So, man, you need a job, Josh? That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but providing yeah, just a decent summary over like the charging industry as a whole, multifamily is in need of level two. Yeah, uh, no, you- level two is a massive need across the uh, across the space because it's really where the need is now. Traveling, yes, you need level threes, and that's what the federal funding's for. But level twos is where EV adoption will in, improve, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's yeah. where they're targeted, right, Josh? They're they're along those travel corridors. Yeah. Is yeah. it's where the Nevi stuff is. So, well, and the funding is for round one is to fill those corridors, but for round two and beyond, I mean, like, you can look at putting these level two systems in, and so that's where I mean, you're going to see thousands and thousands of plugs being installed and only a, a, a small fraction of them will be the DC fast charters. Yeah. But right now all the hype in that space is the fast charger network, because that's what has to be filled out before the funds can be used for level two chargers. Yeah. And we, and, and the level two would be based on state and approvals. Nobody has done that yet. Nobody has put that out there yet, but we anticipate that that could be a opportunity once all AFCs are filled and um, within the 50 mile range for that particular state and have been constructed and have been approved. So there is some steps to go and we haven't, nobody has posted, they will do X, but uh, there's a chance that that could happen. All these states are dealing with the red tape of getting their DC charging network approved with the federal government. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for now, the, the independent companies like Switch and like Blink and some of the others that are out there doing these level two deployments, um, the, the infrastructure is going out. But, you know, if you really want to improve adoption, have reliable level two networks spread throughout the uh, regions and in the cities and in the workplaces and then the, the multifamily complexes. And that's really what's going to improve and encourage uh, EV adoption. Yeah. I mean, you're pretty much on the head, like 80% of drivers right now are charging either at home or at work. Right. And so if you can't solve that problem, that's a big issue. And so the, the out in town kind of opportunistic charging is really just a, you know, Hey, it's, it's a convenient, I'm going to be here for an hour shopping. I might as well, get a few kilowatts of juice, right? And it's a lot of that. But if you can really tackle the main issue of just making your home the fueling station, and then when you really even break down the data even more, um, you know, the average commuter, especially, I guess it's region by region, but let's say the Boston area, for instance, just because that's my area, the average commuter is like doing 45 miles tops, right? And so you can easily achieve that um, with a level two. And that gives us a lot of room to play with energy-wise in the building. Therefore, 
allowing us to add more charging to the building, knowing that not everybody's pulling in that garage with a dead battery and needing to get at a hundred in like four hours. Right. So we're dealing with longer dwell times. So overnight charging, uh, which is giving us a ton of freedom to allocate a lot of different power to different cars over the garage and, or, uh, you know, outdoor scenario. Um, and it's just really kind of allowing us to add more charging to a building um, and allowing more residents to simultaneously charge, which is nice. Yeah, the only so thing even, to that is, you know, the the charging network specifically. I mean, the infrastructure that's required on the backside to support a level three fast charger is yeah. so much more severe and expensive yeah. and demand charges and so much more of a headache. The level two network, you can wire into some regular electric panel boxes and have it ready to go. And yeah. so that's that makes it a lot more sustainable to get yeah. meaningfully yeah. installed in an apartment complex. Installing a 150 kilowatt charger versus a 20 kilowatt charger, it's a big, big difference when it comes to uh, a multifamily home putting in a deployment. Out. Surprised too, like a lot of people that we speak to, just you know, they don't know much about the industry, so they just want the biggest and the fastest one. And it goes against everything in my sales training to like downsell them but it's like not really because if you think about it you're like well you can put one dc fast charger in your parking lot and you've got 600 residents so what are you going to do there like you're going to have a line a mile long waiting to use this thing and then you're going to deal with like loitering and people you know not leaving the plug whereas for that same cost you can get 20 chargers if not more and you can simultaneously charge all those people at the same time and so you kind of have to really, a lot of our job is just educating at this point, just because this, this uh, industry is still very much in its infancy. So, and I got to think the demand charge of a DC charger on a property compared to what you're going to be able to load level when you're looking at AC charging. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys do some type of load leveling where, yep. uh, you, how does that typically work? Actually, you know, let's say you've got 20, are you doing it per every two per every five, the all 20 year linked? How did how does well, that work? Great question. Um, so a lot of it just depends on what's available. So let's say if in this scenario, we don't have the ability to bring in a dedicated EV service, right? So we're utilizing what's existing on the on the panel. So we've got a mixed load panel. Maybe it's got 400 amps on it. Uh, maybe we've got like 200 amps to play with. We have a piece of technology, which is essentially like a, it's called switch control, which is a CT clamp that hooks up to the panel and it reads the other loads that are happening in that panel. So it's utilizing power when it's not being used and bringing it into the charging system. And then when that building starts to get busy, let's say everybody's getting home from four to six and turning on the HVACs and turning on lights, that building is going to start to bubble up and hit that demand scenario. And it's going to call out to our chargers to curtail down the power during that really busy time in the building. And as the building quiets down, it'll redirect that power back to the chargers when it's quiet and overnight and everybody can kind of get that charge again. So we have a ways to do it um, in the retrofit scenario. And even on just the simplest forms with our software, we can power share. So maybe you want to set up a two to one or a three to one or a four to one that's done automatically with our software. So what about the um, uh, like the different times of day? So do you have it set up to where it's dynamically priced? Um, if I'm if I'm plugged in, do is there an app where I can see, you know, what's going on? When my car, car is charging. How much longer? Because I'm assuming these aren't, you know, these are probably uh, shared parking spots that have these for the most part. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. So do a lot of things with the software. So as a uh, access to the dashboard, let's say you're the property manager, you can change all the pricing and do all the bells and whistles there. We can do it for you. But the nice, some of the feature sets are like time of day pricing, uh, loitering penalties. We can do time of day loitering penalties. Um, we can charge by kilowatt and or by time. So there's a lot of different ways that we can customize it to work the best for you. Um, and we also do a revenue remittance. So at the end of every quarter, whatever you've driven for revenue in those chargers, we're going to remit back to the entity every single quarter. That's really cool. Yeah, that's, that's a great feature. Yeah. And it, all that, we track it all. So there's no like smoke and mirrors here. It's all on the dashboard. You can get super granular on these chargers and see who's using it, how they're charging. Like, are they using an RFID card? Are they using the app? Uh, are they checking out as a guest? Um, and this information really isn't to bury them with data. It's really to help them make some more informed decisions. So based upon utilization, right? So let's say we're hitting that 20 to 30% utilization rate. 
and they've only got six chargers at their building, maybe it's time to add six more, right? And because of the demand there. And so we're just giving that all that information to, to help make some more informed decisions going forward. Does somebody have to know, I mean, we just kind of touched on that Nevi isn't quite to the stage where it's uh, kind of helping fund some of these projects, but do you, does somebody have to know my local utility has maybe rebates available or municipalities? How does that work? No, we're pretty dialed in. Uh, we've got a whole team that's like grants and incentives. So we are very privy with all the incentives that are out there in the U.S. Um, and then every rep like myself and, uh, and my reps that work with me, we're all very in tune with what's happening in our region. So in Massachusetts, like Eversource and National Grid are two of the big players in the utilities here. And we're on all their approved vendor lists. So if we have an opportunity to put this through that incentive program for a property where maybe it'll take off 80%, 90% of the installation cost, we're going to ask if they want to do that and we'll run it through for them. No, one of the things that always grabs my attention is a place, you know, when it comes to EVs like Colorado, where they have all these crazy incentives and they can stack federal and state yeah. and you have these like you know, Nissan Leafs being leased out for $20 a month is, yeah. is there an equivalent place in the United States, right? Where um, they could be highlighted to be like, man, let me tell you about this place in the middle of Iowa. Man, yeah. if you are living there, call me right now because yeah. it's practically <laughs> free. Like, yeah. have you, do you have places like that where the incentives are so stacked that you're like, man, if you're not doing this, you're just, you're crazy. Yeah. I mean, I kind of live in a state that's doing that right now with Eversource. Like they're, I just got back a million dollar incentive. Uh, you know, total project cost was 1.3. We got a million dollars for 66 chargers. Right. And that's for soup to nuts all in. Um, we also offer at switch, which I don't, haven't seen another company do is we can use a 30 C tax credit there as well. Um, we can apply that on behalf of the end user where they can take an on bill financing like discount and or just wait till the next year till their taxes come out in April and they can get the full amount. Um, so that can take off another 30 to 40 K depending on what the total amount is. So there's a lot of weird like gray nuance areas um, across the country, obviously, like California is insane, but we're finding all these weird little like like Denver, right? Like Colorado being one of them. Uh, Florida actually has, has gotten some stuff cooking down there. The Carolinas, like Duke Energy, there's some random little, Maryland is a big player now. They're starting to really come out with some great programs. Um, our company at Switch, we just won a massive RFP for Exelon Utility. Um, so BG&E, Pepco, and Delmarva, where we're taking over like 900 chargers that are pre-existing there and kind of coming in as a unified front under one platform. So there's a lot of like weird little niche pockets in the U S and we've got a whole team that's very much involved in that. Um, as like the salespeople, we just, we can't get bogged down in that day-to-day -day stuff. So we've got a lot of really good people on our team that do that for us, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. I just love hearing about it because to me, there's so much potential. I mean, the, the number of uh, certainly like in LA where it was just highlighted on a recent out of spec about how so many people were at EA chargers and uh, many of them just didn't have charging because their apartment complexes don't support it. They don't have them. And you got these lines of people charging to a hundred percent at a DC charger. And, uh, and it's out there, it's out there in these Metro areas and man, there's so much low hanging fruit there to be had. Yeah, like uh, Washington State level two is really good. Um, there are Pacific Power uh, communities grants. There's there's a bunch of grants and like EVIP stuff that you can do. And um, yeah, I mean, I've got a list in front of me now from Alabama to California to Georgia. Um, you know, the send Nebby me that list. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So we we really just try to. As a company, we try to fluctuate towards the hot spots and just capture whatever we can for our clients. And, you know, a lot of these portfolios are nationwide, so they're going to also kind of go yeah. where the money is, too. So we can help them navigate their search and where should we start type of thing. OK, so pretend I am a real estate developer and I have apartments, I have a shopping complex and I kind of want to do level two chargers in Boston to make it easy. And I'm going to come to you and say, OK, I'm going to pay for all this in scratch. I'm not going to have any incentives because, again, that's all over the place. Yeah. Roughly how many kilowatts a day could you say is estimated on a large basis of my three or four properties I own? How many kilowatts does these level twos on average use? Say I have 100 in Boston. Yeah. Is that 
you know, $5 worth a day profit. That way I can determine what my ROI is. What kind of ROI are we looking at? Yeah, the ROI calculator is a tricky thing. It's a bit of smoke and mirrors, right? Because the biggest drivers are, what are you charging to use these and how many transactions per day, right? And so if you're in a hot spot, like you mentioned your scenario, maybe you've got like a MUD on the top floors and you've got a commercial first floor where you've got people off the street that are doing shopping that are coming for some opportunistic charging. And then you've got residents above. We can kind of go about it a few different ways where we can do tiered pricing structures. So people off the street pay more and then the residents pay a lesser amount um, that can kind of offset your cost there. Um, and then we can look at amperages too. So maybe you want like the 80 amps, maybe on the first floor, uh, because that's where all the people are going to be coming in for an hour or two doing some shopping, but the residents are getting 32 amps because it's not as important to get as fast of a charge. Right. So we can kind of, play around with your use case um, and make some assumptions and then also try to help you build an ROI that way. It's tough to just give you a number on kilowatts used, but if you figure you've got 10 80 amp chargers, you know, it's 19.6 kilowatts per, per transaction per day. Let's say you on a, a conservative number, you're doing four transactions a day, like, like just do the math, right? Um, so about 40 kilowatts on, on a deal like that, I, that's kind of where we were thinking too. We were, you know, the hard part, like you said, is, okay, what if you have all the parking garages of X, Y, or Z, or if you're able to go to all the tourism areas with the state, you partner with the state on that. Obviously the numbers are going to be all over the place, right? but on average, I'm sure somewhere there is a, okay, you're going to do five kilowatts a day average across these thousand that you have across the state. You know, yeah. those are kind of the numbers when you start looking at it, you know that that's going to grow exponentially as adoption happens as well. So sure. going to a developer and saying, look, it might be X today that you're having to pay for this, but here's what it does for your people that you have. Yeah. And B, you're going to make money as this long term deal happens. Yeah, we see a lot just being in this business too. Like they use that Kevin Costner, Fuel the Dreams reference a lot, like mm -hmm. and they will come, right? And so when I started this two and a half years ago, some of the clients that I was working with were, were like, yeah, we'll put two stations in because we don't have any real EV drivers yet. And now they're coming back and saying, hey, Sean, like we need like 10, right? And because what are you doing there? You're putting in optics in your building that like, hey, this is something we offer. And so those people who have been on the fence about buying an EV because of the range anxiety or just wasn't quite sure what was available, you know, the price points were too high then. But now like the kind of like what we were talking about, Chris, the other day is like, the, you know, the secondhand market of, of used EVs is a lot more predominant than it was a couple of years ago. And so a lot more people are getting into the EV space and now you're offering something at your, it's an amenity now that you can offer. And now you're yep. seeing a lot of people buying EVs and showing up with them and needing a place to charge. So um, it's kind of a long way of saying like, you know, if you're going to dig into and do all this trenching and stuff, we do a lot of future proofing, right? And so let's say you only put in six chargers now, at least run the conduit to like 20 stations, right? And that way, on the second time around, you can just have an electrician come in, hook the station up, we can get it commissioned and off you go, right? Because all that conduit's already been laid. So we're trying to do a lot of that stuff. And a lot of the incentive programs are requiring that too. So there's a lot of legislation around new builds, right? So in Massachusetts, for instance, 20% of the EV par of the parking spaces have to be EV ready, right? And so that can be a big number for a lot of these bigger, like, bigger buildings where they've got 600 spaces. They're like, oh shit, that's a lot of spaces that I've got yeah. to buy. <laughs> They're not super happy about it, but think about like you're digging, you're kind of measuring once cutting or measuring twice cutting once kind of thing. Right. And so you're, you're really future proofing yourself for a lot of money spent because that electrician is going to charge you the same amount of money to come back and do the same thing over again. So uh, we see how do, you, how do you approach the strategy of what, uh, I guess what chargers to put in there and even what connectors, because the, you know, the, the big dog is, is obviously Tesla. They've got millions out there. Then cumulatively, you've got a pretty big market of, of the kind of the everyone else, but then the future is supposed to be Nax. And do you, do you mix up charging cables? Do you just rely, you pick one and then someone's got to have adapters. Like what's the strategy you're finding out there for dealing with that mix? Yeah, no, it's a, another great question. Um, I think the EV industry, it, it's a bit of the cart before the horse scenario on the NACs, right? And so 
everybody that we're going to be going to next is like kind of the unified front connector, which I think everyone's excited about. I it's a better connector. I love it. It's lighter. It's easier to use all X, Y, and Z reasons why. Right. But the problem is, is that all the car manufacturers aren't really making cars still with, with that connector. So what do we do? Right. And as a company, we're selling thousands of chargers without the NAX connector. So how do we figure this out? And I think the adapter is going to be the, the mediary piece that gets us through until manufacturers are fully sending out all the NAX requirements. And so what we've done as a company is we've manufactured our own uh, model of, of connector and adapter that can hook up to all of our pre-existing charges that we've already sold um, for like sub a hundred bucks. And you can have a really nice piece of hardware that can give you both uh, options if you need it. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And then like as the manufacturers are, you know, we've gotten kind of a handshake deal so far from all the manufacturers that we work with saying they're going to be ready by X date of this year or next year. So we're just kind of in that weird middle position of we got to keep things flowing as a business, but we also know that this is coming, but not everything's ready for that to happen yet. So we're in this kind of weird holding pattern. So we've decided that the, uh, the adapter piece is going to be kind of the solve all for now. And, and these things are kind of an interesting kind of good intentions, but not always well executed scenarios when it comes to this stuff, because um, I, I haven't confirmed this, uh, but I had seen recently um, some, sp- I, don't, I don't know how to, f- this is highly speculative because I don't know, because I don't know personally the source, but the something that I saw is that in 2025, where a lot of people were thinking like, the F-150 Lightning, for example, and the Mach-E would go to NAX, um, that that the upcoming 25 models, from from what the dealer is hearing, you know, the dealers kind of find out these things with with internal memos, and um, and uh, I haven't confirmed it beyond the one thing that I saw, is, is that it's still going to be CCS, and that, that could be, they could already have commitments with supply chain, right? That uh, and, and I think if you look at some of these commitments, they, they've said... That they'll um, that they're going to transition to NAX, but that doesn't mean that in twenty twenty five everything immediately turns a corner to NAX. Right. Yeah. It, it could be new models only. It could be you know a transition could take a long time. We're not seeing the adapters rolling out yet for you know Volkswagen, GM, all these other places for DC, much less AC transitions. So who knows how long that you know yeah. that good intention. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of the the underlying statement here is who knows. Right. And so we're just trying to stay nimble and, and be able to facilitate anything we can in the, in the midterm. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a topic of discussion quite often with our manufacturers and the people that we work with predominantly. And, and so it, hopefully we'll be the first to know when, when it comes to that. <laughs> but right now this is what we've decided to kind of go with to help solve a problem where we've already sold charges to buildings. They want to add more. They want the NAX. Like this is an easy fix for them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, what kind know. of greed are we looking at? Do we have people? So I'm not going to tell who the, the person is we charged with, but there was a six kilowatt charger we did in a major city in Tennessee. And it was 47 cents, I think, per kilowatt for a six kilowatt <laughs> system. And I think it was even based on time. Wow. But yeah, so it was uh, the way it worked out was just nuts that it was 30 some dollars. And we ended I up plugged into like, level two before yeah. and based on the charge rate, it was like 80 cents a kilowatt. And I was like, I mean, that's. Yeah. So obviously DC fast charge, we're trying to push the 40, uh, uh, you know, 40 cents per kilowatt uh, mm-hmm. on DC fast charge with 400 kilowatt delivery. Um, once you get into having the. Uh, lower demand charges, you know, you're looking at nine to 10, 11 cents in our area per kilowatt. Are your clients looking basically at the double that or do a quarter of that? What, what kind of profit margin are they looking at when they price? Yeah, no, it depends on the use case, I guess. Right. And so if it's a workplace or multi-unit dwelling, um, you don't, you don't want to like gouge your residents, right? So we have a whole team that we call our go live team that kind of gets with the end user after these are installed and commissioned and we help them set them up with them, like kind of a hand holding process. And we look at a lot of their figures of like, what are they paying currently per kilowatt? And we get them to a net zero, right? So you're never going to lose money on these charges. You have to charge X in order to break even here. And so that's kind of our starting point. 
And after that, ultimately they can charge whatever they want. Um, they can do time of day pricing. They can, maybe they want to up the pricing after the nine to five hours of the workplace charging where people off the street can use them, but they pay more. Um, so there's a lot of like flexibility there. Um, but ultimately if, if it's also just a public facing charger, we look at kind of the demographics around it, right? Like there's a lot of uh, free data out there, like plug share and things like that. And to see kind of what the people around you are charging and to, stay within those limits because we don't want this to turn into like one like the gas station model where people are driving an extra mile to save a cent a gallon right and so you kind of you don't want to gouge anybody but you also don't want to lose money so we have to kind of play in that middle gray area so it again it's it's a kind of a case by case but we do have a, a dedicated team to help the end user set these up with adding all the feature sets and um, getting them to a, a good starting point. And then we can reevaluate the data, like, you know, six months from now or three months from now or a week from then, like, you know, this, whatever we put in for a pricing structure isn't set in stone. It's all very easy, easily malleable. Um, and they can change it themselves. They can call us, we can do it for them, but maybe on the DCFC front, maybe they screwed up and they're like, Oh, you know, we're really leaving a lot of money on the table here. Maybe we could up it a little bit and we can just go in there and they can as well and adjust their pricing. So this, we can adjust all this stuff very easily with a couple clicks, which is nice. So I, I think as we kind of round out the conversation, man, like where do people find you when, if somebody's like, like, Hey, I'm an HOA manager. I'm, you know, I'm, I've got a, I've been looking for this solution. This sounds like something that I really, you know, have been trying to get engaged with. Like, how do they, how do they find you? How do they reach you? Yeah, we've got a great website at switchenergy.com, no I, so S-W-T-C-H energy.com, uh, where we've got a ton of information on there. We just launched that updated last year and it looks beautiful, so it's very easy to navigate. Um, LinkedIn's a great source, so please find me on LinkedIn, Sean Murphy, S-E-A-N, um, and I'm happy to kind of get you to the right people if you're not in my market, but we work kind of as a unified front, all the reps across the U.S., so we're not super territorial. If you've got a place over here, I'll set you up with the right person in our team. So I would say those two are the are the best resources. And we have a pretty active um, shows as well. So we go to a lot of the, like the RE pluses and the bigger shows across the US. So usually have booths. So keep an eye out if you're ever at a show, look for our switch booth because we're probably there. Do you have one coming up that you want to shout out? Yeah, we've got a uh, yeah, RA plus. Yeah, <laughs> that one's a big one. So I'm going to be at a few in in Maryland this year. Um, uh, so yeah, we've we've got a, a handful of the circuit. I'm happy to share that with you guys too as well. Awesome. And it's also to so thank you, man. This has been great. I've I've been a big fan of your show and and uh, really honored to be here. So thank you guys. Appreciate the time. Sorry it took us so long to get this tightened up <laughs> there it goes Sched it, mostly blast. mostly my fault because you guys are on the east coast time zone and i'm out here in california we're messing things up for the for the schedule but <laughs> thanks for the flexibility we yeah we've been trying to have this discussion for a while and it's something that um i i really believe is is a huge gap and i i'd love to see more of this stuff deployed and that we have so many giant complexes and apartment areas and there's so much of that multifamily unit it, everywhere I see, at least in California, I don't know about in the other parts, but man, every time there's an empty lot, it is not single family homes. that's going up. It is three story tall density housing. And, and it is, uh, you know, a lot of shared parking, uh, multi-unit complexes. We just don't see big sprawling, you know, neighborhoods like from the fifties and sixties anymore. We just, we just don't. I know. I drive my wife nuts every time we're driving around. I'm always like poking around and pulling into random lots. And like, <laughs> it takes us 20 minutes longer to get anywhere because of me. But no, it's true. It's it's a problem we're really trying to solve. And that's kind of where we've cored out our business at Switch. And so if you have any inquiries about that type of stuff and looking to get some EV charging in your portfolio at your site, like please reach out. Happy to help. Reach out. Track them down at the next show. Yeah, yeah man. Absolutely. We'll put the... We'll put your website uh, and your LinkedIn in the description so people can uh, access it through there. But thank you guys. yeah, thank Click you. So like, much. share, and subscribe. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you for the conversation around level twos. I mean, I think the the dialogue around that's a lot. Um, and you know, we we talk a lot about the different vehicles and things, but the charging network something that really is um, in progress and under a lot of development and kind of. Uh, 
excited to see how the space is developing as an EV driver myself, get, getting that uh, ball pushed down the field because that really will help, you know, the driver experience, but also promote adoption. So for sure. absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Turn Down for What. Tune in next week for more EV news and updates. Thanks for tuning in to Turn Down for What. Make sure you're subscribed with your notifications on to tune in to more EV news and updates. Want to win a Starlink? Follow the directions in the description below. See you next time. Thank you.